story, and it's a story that comes from one of my favorite theological magazines, and the author of this story, his name is Brian. We're walking through the park, and my five-year-old asked me, where's God? I'm not sure what sparks his question, a leaf falling from its branch, the chimes by the wind, A cat that curls up its back and stares at us as we pass. Where's God? He asks again. I take his face in my hands and I tell him to look at me. God is in my face. And God is in your face. And look at your hands. God is in your hands. Look at the stick you've been carrying. God is in that stick. God's a stick. You're God? Am I God? God is me? He asked. Well, no, not at all. God is not you or me or that tree exactly. I can tell as a father I'm beginning to dig a hole for myself. You see, God is in all those things because God holds all these things together, I try to explain. My five-year-old doesn't look convinced. We bend down over a patch of dirt, and I scoop up a little soil that isn't hiding under the dandelions, and I say the dirt is us, but the hands are God. So I squeeze, and I press till the oils and sweats of my palms mix in with the dirt, and then I spit on it just a little bit for good measure, which makes my little boy laugh. That little pile of dirt becomes a ball. So I keep squeezing and rolling it in my hands to keep it damp. I am in this ball because part of me is in it. But the dirt isn't the same thing as me. I'm not the same as dirt, but it has a part of me, so it stays a ball because I keep giving it something of myself. I keep giving parts of myself because I want it to be. And I want it to be because I love it. He takes his hands out and he says, can I hold it now? Can I be God now? To talk about God, maybe we don't need more words. Maybe we just need a few words to describe what it's like to play in the dirt. On Ash Wednesday, that's actually the exact day that Lent begins. And on Ash Wednesday, we literally put dirt on our foreheads. We take the palms from last year that the children wave. We burn them down to ash, mix a little oil, and we impose the dirt on our foreheads. And whoever imposes the ashes says, remember you are dust and to dust you will return. So repent and believe in the gospel. Fundamentally, we're made from the earth. And one day we'll return to it. And it's what happens in the middle that's the most important. Symbolically, we're in the middle of what happens between Ash Wednesday and Easter morning. And what happens is very important. Because Lent is that season of discipline. It's that season of self-examination. It's a season of temptation. It's a season to deepen our faith. From where I'm from, though, it's a season of dirt. Where I'm from, everybody knows whether they went to church or not, everybody knows to play in the garden. Every Ash Wednesday, everybody I knew would run outside and plant bulbs. And then on Good Friday, everybody I knew planted tomatoes. 
That was the cycle. And it's what we did in the dirt, in our yards, in the earth, that made Easter morning and what followed beautiful. And I have to tell you, I have great memories of playing in the dirt. There was something about it. It was refreshing. It was renewing. I have beautiful memories of being with people I love while my jeans and my knees were getting dirty. When I would sink my hands into the soil and break it up or dig a hole or make room for something else. It felt good. It felt renewing. There's a reason for that. We literally were made to take care of the earth. Genesis 2 says this. Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. We were created to garden. A little later in Genesis, Genesis 32, there's a great story about a man named Jacob. If you've been coming to church your whole life, you've probably heard a sermon or two about Jacob. If you haven't been coming to church your whole life, don't worry, because I'm going to tell you what you need to know about Jacob today. Jacob was traveling with his family, and he was nervous about who they would meet on the way, on the journey. So one night, Jacob said, okay, family, y'all go back there, and I'm going to go ahead of you in case I meet anyone unfriendly. So here's Jacob, and he goes to sleep, and guess what happens? He begins to wrestle with a man. Do you remember this story? He wrestles with a man, and they wrestle so much that the man actually breaks or touches the hip socket of Jacob, and they wrestle all day and all night, and daybreak is coming, and Jacob says, you need, or the other man says, you need to let me go, and Jacob says, not till you give me a blessing, and that's the part that people remember, and the angel, God, the person he wrestled with, says, your name is no longer Jacob, but it's Israel. Jacob wrestled. If you do the translation of wrestling, it means to get dusty. Jacob was getting dusty. Of course, being in the dirt is not just an Old Testament reference. There are a few New Testament references of it as well. I'm going to mention two that are in John. The first one is John 8. And it comes from uh, verse 7. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground in the dirt. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and just wrote on the ground. Don't you want to know what he wrote? And this is such a wonderful passage because I have no idea what he drew in the ground. Have you ever been with a child and you bent down and played in the dirt? Maybe you drew your name or you wrote a letter or two, or maybe you made a stick figure. That's what Jesus is doing. Let your imagination run wild with this. What in the world could he possibly write in the dirt? Could he be practicing his signature in the dirt? Maybe showing the scene with a little stick figure with a dress with the woman? The possibilities are endless. A chapter later, though, Jesus is around another crowd. And there's a man who is blind. And this blind man has captured the attention of everybody. And all of the people, you know, they're always trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to trip him up a little bit. And so in chapter 9, all of the people begin to ask Jesus, what is wrong with his parents that this man would be made blind? 
What sin did the parents commit? What sin did the man commit? Because surely the blindness is a fault of someone else. And Jesus says, it's not the fault of anyone or anything. And so John 9, chapter 6 says this. When he had said this, he spat on the ground in the dirt and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's face, saying to him, go and wash in the pool. And he went and he washed and he came back and was able to see. Like Adam, we've been asked to till the ground. Like Jacob, we've been invited to know God through getting dusty. Jesus has given us the example to use dirt to play, to draw, and to heal. And if you don't believe me, look around and see what it can do. I have a friend, and my friend said, Marion, I don't know what happened. I missed fall altogether. I missed like the whole season of it. She said, I was so busy with my life. She said, somehow every time I was in the car, I was on the phone talking. Every time I was at home, I was doing all of the work of home. When I was at work, I was worrying about work and home and when I was going to leave and go to the car. She said, I was so busy with my life. I looked up one day, and everything that was supposed to be orange and red, they were all on the ground, and they were brown. She said, I'm not going to miss this next season. This is the next season. We're in the season of Lent, a time when all of the brown becomes new life of green. We're in the season where things that we think are dead can be brought back to life. We're in the season of whatever work we do right now can possibly bear fruit later. I've invited Lauren Murphy to join me today. Lauren is the brains behind what we call our giving garden. In the fall of 2019, Lauren said, hey, Let's make a garden. And we were like, okay. And by spring of 2020, believe it or not, the garden that Lauren visioned was actually providing food when there was none. Somehow a vision of what can be done in the dirt and taking care of the dirt led to fruit and carrots and cucumelons <laughs> and tomatoes. And it's actually one of the most beautiful, symbolic, and tangible things on this campus to show what can happen when we play in the dirt. Because the earth of our garden has provided respite it's provided people a place to work. It's provided a place for people to get to know one another. And it's provided a place for us to feed. Because in 2019, when Lauren said, let's make a garden, it was never Lauren's intention to do it alone. She couldn't till the ground and plant the ground and care for the ground and harvest the ground by herself. There have been hundreds of people now a part of our garden. And that's really what's the most renewing about it. That's really what's important. It's the relationships that the dirt has provided. And so while we think about the earth as our greatest resource, maybe it's the resource of the relationships through the dirt that is the greatest. Adam, Adam was never in the garden alone. We know that. Jacob wasn't in the field alone. We know that. 
And Jesus was always around people in the crowds when he taught his lessons. We were never meant to play in the dirt alone. But we were meant to learn how to have a greater sense of our faith through it with other people. To say it another way, I am in this ball because part of me is in it. But the dirt isn't the same thing as me. I'm not the same as dirt, but it has a part of me. And the dirt will stay a ball because I keep giving it something of myself. I keep giving parts of myself because I want it to be. And I want it to be because I love it. Meet Lauren. Uh, Hi, I'm Lauren, and I love to play in the dirt. Um, For me, the garden is a really big way that I experience God. I actually don't have enough time to tell you all of the ways that I experience God through gardening. I just could kind of ramble about it. But um, yes, I enjoy putting down my dinging phone, getting away from the to-do list of my life, and working with my hands to join God in his creation. I actually, I wasn't like raised on a farm or anything. Um, It was more like I, I don't know, I think I was probably with my mom at Home Depot or something and, you know, we were looking for, she probably wanted roses or hydrangeas or something and then I saw like the, the food section with the like tomato plants and I was like, wait, like, we can do that? <laughs> um, and since then I've been so fascinated at the, the idea that we can grow our own food. I think nowadays if you grow up in the suburbs and you, grow, you go to the grocery store to get your food, sometimes it's easy to get a bit separated from what nourishes us. But learning how food grows has created in me such love, respect, and admiration for God's creation. God created this perfect, beautiful system to not only create our food, but to clean, steward, and decorate this planet. The system of soil, plants, and insects was created by God to be perfectly balanced. And you know what's amazing? We are invited to join in that process. It will happen with or without us, but by joining, we can experience joy in learning, nurturing growth, creating beauty, and finally, nourishing ourselves with a delicious meal. Remember what Mufasa said in The Lion King? He said, everything you see exists together in a delicate balance. As king, you need to understand that balance and respect all the creatures, from the crawling ant to the leaping antelope. But dad, don't we eat the antelope? Yes, Simba, but let me explain. When we die, our bodies become the grass, and the antelope eat the grass, and so we are all connected in the great circle of life. (laughs) This makes me think of composting. Does anyone here compost? (laughs) Anybody compost? No? Okay. Um, Composting is the act of taking your yard clippings and kitchen scraps, mixing them together, and waiting for them to decompose and form the perfect fertilizer for your plants. God literally created a world where our waste becomes fuel for more growth. It's the original recycling system. You know, the forest floor acts this way. The leaves fall. No one rakes them up. They mulch the ground for the winter, they create a blanket for the insects, and they decompose into beautiful soil feeding the trees. When I garden, I think, wow, if he created this system to not only feed us and all the other creatures, but created it to be so beautiful and lovely and delicious that just experiencing it would bring us such pleasure What does that say about how much he loves us and how much he loves to bring us joy? When I garden, I witness the multiplication of seeds, that a single seed will grow dozens of fruits, each fruit containing hundreds of seeds, and each of those seeds can also grow a plant and yield just as many fruits. And I remember the potential for the multiplication of God's love, God's Power and the potential for the multiplication from a single action in his name. When I garden and a plant is struggling, yes, I have killed many plants, and despite my greatest effort, it dies, I remember that sometimes we get to harvest wisdom instead of food, and failure helps us grow. Right now, 
I have a bunch of baby seedlings on a rack under grow lights at my house. They're uh, for the garden and for my house, and um, they're growing and waiting for the warm April weather before they're transplanted outside. I have a fan pointed at them. Do you know why I have a fan pointed at them? It's because being exposed to a breeze helps them grow stronger, thicker stems so they can prepare for life in the outside wind. If they're not exposed to this, they'll, they might grow thin and weak, and they may struggle when suddenly put outside. Imagine us as seedlings. Imagine that sometimes God hands us a windy season now and then to make us stronger so that when a real storm comes in, we can handle it. My friends, the most important thing the garden has taught me is community. Did you know that herbs grow best when you grow all sorts of stuff together? That plants grow best when you put all, all sorts of them together? Herbs can repel insects with their strong scents. And some flowers, like nasturtium and milkweed, can bring in pollinators to help pollinate the fruits and the vegetables and also serve as trap crops to keep the bad bugs away from the crops. Did you know that beans will store nitrogen from the air in their roots to restore the soil? And God created us just like the garden. We do better when there is all sorts of us together. Ever since I said, hey, Shauna, what if we started a garden here? God has shown me endlessly how he yearns for us to come together and put our hands in the soil. The work to create the giving garden required much thought and planning, yes. But God ensured that the way was cleared for the garden at every turn. He put the community in place to build the beds, start the plants, turn the compost, donate supplies, and all that was needed to get the food in the hands of those who need it, just in time for a global pandemic, which I, none of us ever could have predicted. Suddenly there we were in our very first season, and the world seemed to be collapsing around us, but we could still go to the garden because it was outside, and we could work separately, and we could provide food for those in need. And can you imagine how therapeutic that was for me and the other volunteers to be able to do something in that time where we all felt out of control? And for us to get outside and, and, and handle something when everything felt so unmanageable. Um, then came a time of inflation when family budgets were tighter than ever, and God used our community to provide that nourishment to families in need. People of all ages, all backgrounds, all abilities help in the garden in one way or another. Volunteers with better backs do tougher work. Others who struggle with a regular commitment due to their busy family life pop in and help harvest now and then during the summer. We grow best when there's all sorts of us together. My absolute favorite part of working in the garden is when people I have never met and sometimes who don't even go to this church come by and drop off compost materials from their homes in our bins. Isn't that what this is about, right? There's a space where church members and non-members can just show up and come together to join God in his creation. It just... It gets me so, so excited. Before the modern grocery store, the garden was a big part of communities. Friends, trying to grow all of your own food is very difficult. So if one family had a bumper crop of zucchini while another's failed, but they had plenty of laying hens, they could share zucchini and eggs together. So friends, when I garden, I learned that we grow best when there's all sorts of us together. And to that end, we are going to grow together. So today we have some soil and we have some herbs and we have some pots. And yes, we can come forward and we are going to fill some of these little pots with soil in these little buckets and the shovels that you see. And there's a number of herbs. You can pick your favorite. There's dill, there's sage, there's basil, there's cilantro. And it would be so great if you could fill up one and take a couple seeds from a kind of herb that you enjoy, but you know what would take this to absolutely the next level? If you could put it in a sunny spot, give it some water, and if you could bring it back and share later this spring so that we could actually share food together in creation as a community, oh my gosh, how wonderful would that be? So everybody stand on up now and come forward and let's grow some herbs.
are kind of stuck, aren't they? while you pray. So that's what we're going to do right now. Gracious and holy Lord, I am so grateful for dirt and for seeds and for this church's Chapel Roswell. We thank you for all that you are doing through us. And we ask that your spirit be a part of everything we plant. We ask that you connect our vines and our roots together so that we can learn from one another, nourish one another, so that when we see someone else needing help, we're there quickly with all of the people and situations in our minds. Help 
Help us be the nutrients that those people need in whatever situation they're in. So wherever there is grief, may we be the arms of comfort. Wherever there is long-term treatments, may we be the arms of courage and strength. And when we need to receive that same care, Lord, may you put people in our paths to offer that same faith and grace and compassion. And again, during this Lenten journey, if we've given things up or if we're trying to take on new things, give us what we need to do that well and continue to feed our community of Chapel Roswell and give us life, give us water so that we may be your people in good and healthy and safe ways. Bless us all as we worship, but bless us all too, Lord, as we leave and be a part of this next week. Give us opportunities to share words of love and forgiveness and of value with everyone who's in front of us. Amen.